And then in a couple minutes, in one more minute, we'll go live on Facebook. Nice. What happened? Sorry, sorry. Earthquake. All right, we're going to go live on Facebook now, and then we'll see how this works. Oh, had a title. Artist demo with. Wait, no, is this a demo? Yeah. <laughs> <That> was... <laughs> okay. Oh, crap. What's crap? It's always good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Please do not like jumping out of a plane. <laughs> oh crap! Oops. I think I messed that one up. I'm gonna try that again. It says live on Facebook. Oh, it does on Facebook? Uh, at least from yeah, mine says that. It does. Well, I'm trying to go to our Facebook and see if I can see it on my. Yeah, see if you can see it. Phone. Oh yeah, it's going. I think it's going right. Is it going? I think because the little live window popped up. Mm -hmm. So we're we good. Beliefs? I believe so. It's live. Oh, boy. oh yeah, it is. It is. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's get going. All right. So welcome everyone to the Hudson Center first virtual. Artist Talk. I'm uh, Ty Nicholson. I'm the Ceramic Studio Manager, and I am joined with Kate Driscoll, the Exhibitions Manager, and Hello. we are hosting uh, artist and cup maker extraordinaire Aaron Toole. Hello. Right. Uh, so for the next 45 to 30 minutes, Aaron will be discussing his work with us and his process and a little bit about himself, a little background. Um, Aaron, for those of us who aren't familiar with your work, uh, can you give us kind of a brief overview of what you do? Um, I make cups. <laughs> since I've been making cups seriously since 2001. Since 2001, I've made and given away more than, I'm coming up on 22,000. Um, they're all kind of, in my head anyway, they're all related to my time in the 91 Gulf War, and then kind of how things have, they've evolved as time's gone on. Like the gas mask that I wore in the 91 Gulf War is now, or was used by the police, you know, in the riots in Los Angeles. And so a lot of stuff that happened overseas is now happening in the States. And um, yeah, so they're all kind of political. Um, this I'd say there's kind of two bodies of work. There's like, the cups that are just cups, cups that I make for myself, kind of documenting things that I, I think about. And then there's another body that's kind of, you know, for other people who are also vets or their families or refugees or, um, you know, people ask for specific cups with specific images or insignia. I've been trading insignia. Like I started initially, it was just my insignia. Then my father's insignia, he's a Vietnam vet. And then other people would let me bother insignia. I'd make stamps of them and decorate cups for them. And I'd keep the molds. Now I have <laughs> hundreds of molds. <clears throat> but cups is all. Just make cups. <laughs> Was there more to that question? No, no. Uh, I work at UC Berkeley. I'm the senior laboratory mechanician, the sphincter of ceramics. Everything <laughs> to me. So, well, when the school's in session, right. that's, I load the kilns and fire the kilns. I am not a professor. I teach sometimes, but not online. So, oh, um, go ahead, Kate, sorry. I was, just, I was just wondering, so were you involved in arts before your time in the military or was this afterwards? Afterwards, um, mm -hmm. you know, I went to school. I, I joined the Marine Corps thinking I wanted to be a cop. Uh, LAPD model was to protect and serve, and I was all gung ho for that. 
I joined military police, graduated top of my class, got choice of unit and duty station, picked MP company headquarters battalion, first Marine division, was a field MP, deployed to the Gulf, did enemy prisoner war handling and battlefield circulation and control. And uh, whatever, after that experience, I decided I didn't want to be a gunslinger. <clears throat> I volunteered, I extended for 15 months, uh, was an embassy guard in Rome for 15 months, and then Paris for 15 months, two hardship posts back to back. 100 pounds ago, I looked good in a uniform. Then got out, took the GI Bill, and uh, I didn't want to be a cop anymore, but I still had a desire. I wanted to do something, you know, above crass commercial bullshit. <clears throat> We're on the internet, I can swear, right? Yeah. And uh, we'll edit that in post. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So I thought like, you know, art, science, medicine, those should be, you know, are things that should be above crass commercial garbage. Turns out they're not. <laughs> Broken dreams there. But anyway, so <clears throat> I still have the desire to serve and and I thought art was a way to do that. And and I went to art school, you know, I didn't I maybe should have apprenticed with somebody in North Carolina or a real pot or someplace, but I went to art school. Um, Pasadena City College. Ben Sakaguchi was the instructor there, Japanese American, raised in internment camps. He said all arts political. Then he retired his best friend, Phil Cornelius, uh, ceramics guy. He said anybody can take a good idea and work with it for years, but it takes a special kind of person to take a bad idea and work with it for years. He made really thin teapots and I give stuff away. Then I transferred to USC. Uh, John Mason was teaching that semester as a sabbatical replacement for Ken Price. And then Ken Price came back. That was pretty amazing. I didn't know who he was. It was just Ken, the old dude that served. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, what was the question? Oh, I just, um, I was just curious about like the draw of art to you after all of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't, I resisted for a long time the idea of art as therapy. Um, I went to, you know, I went to art school to make art and, and the things I wanted to talk about were like coming back from the Gulf War and then coming home and seeing your, your war as a video game or a movie. You know, it wasn't a game and um, it was really, it was really odd to see how the civilian world translates the military. And, you know, I'm, through all this, I'm only speaking for myself and my opinions. I'm not arguing with other artists about their practice and what they want to do. But for me, I feel like art is the only, art, I mean, sorry, peace is the only adequate war memorial. Everything else is at best a failure and usually a lie that kind of promotes war as this grand and noble thing. So, right, Stalin said one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. I think that's just total garbage. Like a million war dead is an incalculable tragedy. They all had mothers and fathers and, you know, just the, it's just a huge waste of blood and treasure. So, so talking about war, like it made me nervous. Like I didn't, I wanted, I needed to talk about it, but I didn't know how exactly. And cups seem like the appropriate scale, you know, they're kind of one to one and hand to hand. They're not grand, noble things. And even the same images, you know, in an eight by eight painting or in bronze would be a different thing. But on a cup, they're kind of less intrusive and, you know, you can kind of contemplate it on a different level, especially if you're drinking whiskey or <laughs> something like that. And that's the thing, too, is like I have stories about all the cups and what they mean to me. But what I think is more important is you take the cup back into your life and then somebody you already know, love and trust. You know, maybe maybe something in the cup sparks something and they can talk to you about it, about their experiences, mm -hmm. which I think is important. I think, you know. Talking about war is difficult, and so the temptation is just not to talk about it at all. And you know that feels easier, but I think in the long term it has consequences also. So, yeah. So, as a veteran, do you think uh, it's important for people, and in particular, in particular, other veterans, uh, to have a creative outlet? I mean, I think it helped me, but I think even more than the creative outlet was was the kind of community that happens around it. You know, the, there was a suicide on campus at UC Berkeley and I reached out to the student group and student veteran group and was like, I'm gonna help these young kids. 
and it's been such a joy for me. I, you know, I didn't even realize how much I had missed hanging out with other vets. And it's, it's not, you know, just not to have, don't have to explain yourself or, mm -hmm. or you're not judged the same way when you talk to civilians sometimes. <laughs> so I think the, the community is more important than the creative outlet, but, but definitely sure. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, and I'm grateful too, to the ceramics community. It's such a open, I don't know if it's cause we're working with, you know, it's decomposed granites, right? Like granite. So it's, they were the Appalachians, you know, like the Rockies and now they're all smooth and worn down. There's something about the clay community. It feels like more humble or welcoming than say painters mm -hmm. <laughs> or conceptual artists. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the need to have a community to make ceramics. So I, I, I do kind of argue that ceramicists in general are a little more communal based because of the need to like somebody has to have a kiln and somebody right. needs to have a wheel or access to these things. So, right. you know, we're drawn to one another and the sharing of techniques and materials and recipes and whatnot. Yeah, for sure. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, art as activism? And do you think art needs to send a message or can it just be art for art's sake sometimes? Well, I mean, I think it's like, I mean, anything, I think if you're, I mean, I think first your obligation as an artist is to make your work, period. If you're a painter and painting's dead, it sucks to be you, but you shouldn't start making crappy videos, you know? You should make your work. The world needs you to make your work. You know, an insincere activism, when I was a kid, I worked in high school, I volunteered at homeless youth shelters, mm -hmm. and there were people that would come in to volunteer that were doing it because their pastor told them to, not because they really gave it any, you know, cared about the kids. And it was so hurtful to the kids there because they could tell that the people didn't really care about them, that they were doing it for some, you know, cool points or because they felt obligated. And it really it kind of backfired. They would have been better just giving money to the school, you know, to the, the shelter than to actually show up. So, no, I don't think, you know, if you don't care <laughs> you know, about, about the, you know, then you, I don't think you should make work that, you know, you don't care about. Um, you know, if I could do something else, I might, you know, like, but I just really, it's really, this is the work that I have to make. You know, these are the things that I have to talk about. And a lot of times I feel like I'm just like putting messages in a bottle and lobbing them into the ocean, you know, and hoping that they receive an audience or somebody gets them later. But, you know, if I wanted to do something more than just make pretty things for people with more money than me, you know, it, it's not a great business model. <laughs> but, you know, I don't want to, you know, somebody's kid dies in a war or somebody's brother kills himself. You know, I'm not like, okay, your son died in Afghanistan. Let's talk about the price. You know, how much, how much is this cup worth to you? Like, right. You've already paid, you know, <laughs> so, or mm -hmm. refugees, we've been through so much stuff, you know, it's just, I don't, anyway. So you would say that was like the driving force to why you give your cups away? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the same thing like, uh, right, mission of the Marine Corps Rifle Squad, locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver. And now I feel like, you know, locate, close with, and destroy the enemy through empathy and education and conversation. And, you know, it's the same thing, right? Destroy your enemy, but now destroy your enemy by making him your friend, right? Like, I think a lot of the stuff that's going on in the world isn't malice, isn't even stupidity. It's just ignorance. You know, there's, you don't have somebody in your life who's dying of COVID-19. You haven't seen what that's like for somebody's lungs to fill with fluid and be drowning and, you know, <clears throat> separated from their family. So you're like, eh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, but if you're one of those hospital workers, it'd be a whole different reality to you. Anyway, I just make cups. So have you always just given away cups? That's how it's been from the beginning? How yeah, I mean, you know, the other thing, right, is like, if you, if, if you wanted to get paid, like, how much are you going to pay? What's, what's reasonable for a cup? Like, you know, I, I laugh with that just in general with ceramics, right? If you, if you make a painting on canvas, 12 by 12, it's a painting on canvas. You make the same painting in clay, 12 inches by 12 inches, it's the tile. <laughs> like and they you know they sell it by the square foot so so that's just you know another example of you know commerce and 
capitalism and how we value things, it's not, it doesn't match to me. And so I'd rather just not be involved. And I have had people, like there is some guy on uh, eBay right now trying to sell some cups for a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> Good luck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> I gave four to a fundraiser in the city and a couple weeks later, they sold them at the fundraiser for 400 bucks and then it showed up on, on eBay for $3,000 for four cups. They've dropped the price considerably since then, <laughs> but whatever. I mean, some guy got really in my face and he's like, dude, you know, somebody's going to make money off your work someday. You're just giving it away. And, you know, I guess it's inevitable. Well, you know, that they become commodities at some point, but you know, I, the other thing too, right. If I sell the cup, say I sold them for 20 bucks, right. Then, you take your $20 cup home and you're drinking your coffee when the postman comes and the postman's like, Oh my God, where'd you get that cup? I was in the Marine Corps. You know, you spent 20 bucks on that cup. So you might hold on to it or ask the post guy to give you 20 bucks for it. But if you got it for free, you might just give it to that postman. So, you know, I think as an object maker, the idea, like the ideal situation is to get your cups into the hands of people that really appreciate them. And so by giving them away, I feel like, that makes the odds that they find a home that, you know, of somebody who really appreciates it more mm -hmm. than if they're a commodity. So the message spreads a little further. Well, or just that it gets to the right. I mean, honest to God, I'm not, you know, the cups are just cups and they don't, they're no different than the stuff at Ikea unless they resonate with somebody. Right. I mean, all artists shoot, you read their artist statements. The rest of us should just go home and quit. Like this person's figured it all out. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't I don't share that like I think it's really it means so much to me when people respond to the cups like I mean obviously I'm not really thrilled about making people cry <laughs> you know but but that's a really common response you know when I make somebody a cup for their father or grandfather or somebody who passed <clears throat> or even you know other vets when they have a chance to talk about what they've been through you know or even yeah we have a mutual friend and I gave him a cup and and he just kind of took it and didn't say anything and then sent me this text and it was really <laughs> just brutal like we he didn't he never told me the story face to face but he sent this you know, this written thing of why he chose that cup and what it meant to him and you know it was really moving and so i don't know i i, I didn't have a beard when i started you know i didn't have an evil genius master plan on like oh i'm gonna give stuff away and uh, mm -hmm. It's just how it's worked out, you know. It's just like choose your own ending books, right? Like, oh, do you sell it for ten bucks or give it to him, <laughs> you know? And it just it feels right. When I was in grad school, we had a visitor come and talk to us, and her advice was follow your heart. And I was so mad. I was like, what kind of stupid advice is that? Follow your heart. And then when I look back on what I've done and why I've done it, it pretty much <laughs> was just like this feels good. I'm going to do this one and not, you know, so I don't know. Well, as a, the, the lucky recipient of quite a few of your cups, um, I can I hate to argue with you, but they are more than just cups, you know, but to, man, to, to, to the recipients. Yeah. But it's, that's on you, man. I mean, that's, and thank oh, you. Oh, I know. Yeah. But it's not like you could smash them and ground them down and, you know, their gold or something it's you know, so yeah but that's a nice thing too right like I feel clay is a nice <clears throat> kind of analogy or I don't know the word but like war right war seems really immediate and you must do this or western civilization is going to collapse and you mm -hmm. do the thing and then those those repercussions last infinitely through time right clay only lasts 500,000 to a million years but you know you throw the cup you make your marks you do your little gestures on it and then you throw it through the kiln and then it lasts 500,000 to a million years. And it's the same thing. If you bury it in the ground, you know, somebody digs it up in a thousand years and it's the same exact object. And so that's kind of, like I say, like I have 500,000 to a million years to find a receptive audience for my work, <laughs> you know? And like, I think maybe in five years in 50 years, people are going to look at this time now and be like, what the fuck were people thinking, you know? And, and the cups will be like, this is what I was thinking. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of the world, but, you know, and it's, it is, it's hand to hand. Somebody can fold it to their lips and, you know, it's not quite a handshake or, 
you know, I'm married and monogamous, so <clears throat> I'm not kissing other people, but it is, you know, like hand to hand. They put it to their lips and drink something. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for visiting just... everybody. Like it's, I, I'd be here alone otherwise. <clears throat> I was uh, curious, um, you had sort of touched on this earlier about why you were more drawn to, um, you know, ceramics as opposed to painting. Was it just the vibe of the community or, you know, classes you were taking or was it the actual medium that you were like, okay, this is, this is a good lane for me. This, this feels like a way I can communicate. Well, I mean, I say I started, you know, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I took the GI Bill, went to a community college and I started with drawing and painting. <clears throat> And I did this big painting that I thought had really expressed, it, you know, what I was feeling about the Gulf War. And in the critique, people were crying and you know, all this stuff, but it just sits on the wall, right? And the people there could see it, could see it. But I don't know, but there's something with the cup, you know, that like you take it, and I said, you know, you take it back into your life. And I can still, when I was in France, I got invited to go to France for the, uh, Vend de Forêt. It's this really cool residency in, in northern France near Verdun. And it was the 100 year anniversary of the beginning of World War I. And the director was awesome, Pascal Yannet. I'm pronouncing it wrong, but he, he, he wanted to make a video. And they, they made the video so it just shows me painting the cups, painting the underglaze on the cups. I'm like, man, they're going to think I'm a painter. He's like, yes, exactly. <laughs> like, so I do paint, I do printmaking, I do painting. I do low relief sculpture. It's all on, but it's on the cups. It's mm -hmm. all around the cups. And, you know, again, I feel like that's the right scale to talk about these, like these massive things that there's no way any, any book, any, any sculpture, any movie is going <laughs> to capture the full thing. And so rather than try, I'm just like, I'm just going to make cups. And there's no expectation, right? There's no expectation. Like I got invited to make, um, for the Veterans Book Project, uh, Monica Holler gave a bunch of us software to make our own books. And it was totally intimidating to me to make a book because that has so much cultural weight, you know, like mm -hmm. cups, it's like, oh, best dad ever, <laughs> you know, like whatever. There's no, there's no expectation that a cup is gonna have any kind of grand insight into the universe. So it takes a lot of the pressure off for me anyway. But. I have a, uh, a technical question. Uh, Susan Saloon wants to know, uh, all the cups you're making now, when do you stamp them and or make your mark in them? Um, well, so it's going to work. Which, who, what, are, what are they seeing? Uh, they're seeing both things. All right, yeah. So I threw these cups the day before yesterday and these cups, whoops, these cups yesterday and these cups today. So I have a really damp, dank basement. So I can leave them wrapped loosely <laughs> and uh, I can decorate them over the course of a week. So they just, it just, you know, they have to be hard enough that I can stamp them without the stamp sticking to them and wet enough that I can still stamp them. So, uh, so that's not a good answer. In Los Angeles, you know, where it's hot and dry, I couldn't, by the time I, like if I was throwing 30 cups, say, at the, on the 30th cup, the first cup was too dry to stamp. So it just depends on the weather. And, but yeah, I mean, it's just a feel, you know. Sorry, I didn't answer that question. Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a joke with Clay. Like you can show, you can watch every YouTube video and you can, you know, get every great piece of advice. But in the end, you know, it's just like your hand-eye coordination. You got to figure it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, there's other potters that can get away with all kinds of stuff that I can't do, you know, so. But yeah. Uh, we have another question um, from uh, Roman Baca. Um, I'm a fellow veteran artist and resonate with what you said about empathy. I use the performing arts to encourage empathy in audiences. Could you talk a little more about that? How do your cups build empathy? Well, I mean, all right, so. So my, my statement that I said, I just make cups, that really, part of that 
you know, oh, you're so humble. But part of that is just self-defense, right? Like I had all kinds of great fantasies about what I was doing when I joined the Marine Corps. The gap between what I thought I was going to do and what I did was kind of vast and painful. So, so I get a little nervous talking about what the, comp the cups accomplish or what the cups, you know, do. But I think, you know, just, I feel like it's, it's kind of, you know, empathy, like making connections with people just kind of builds, you know, if you don't know the person or you just saw that one clip of them holding that flag on YouTube, you know, you don't really have a lot of empathy for them, right? But after you have a conversation or maybe share a beverage, that kind of builds, I feel like, and, and makes it harder to, you know, I think the atrocities that are committed around the world are, you know, it's easier because you don't know them. If they speak a different language or they look different or the, the food smells weird, it makes it easier to do bad things to them because, you know, we're saying the person on the street who smells a little bit like piss because they don't have access to the bathrooms, like it's easier to dismiss them because they're not like you, you know, but, but it's still a person, you know, and maybe they're struggling with drugs or alcohol, like, <laughs> but, you know, they're still a person. And um, so I think any kind of, any kind of exchange, you know, verbal or objects or actually that was a, so I had two residencies where I was able to sit in a place and work. One was in Palo Alto and the idea was to make work and, and share the cups, right? One was in Palo Alto and one was in downtown Oakland. And I set up in both places and was working and Palo Alto, I met no vets and um, well, maybe one or two, uh, but people didn't have a real connection. But then in Oakland, and I felt really awkward about being a big white boy parachuting into downtown Oakland and setting up my wheel and I'm here to make pots for you boys and girls. But, but there I met a lot of people who were vets and having trouble with drugs and alcohol or, or not, but, but I met a lot more vets in downtown Oakland. And I remember once there was, there was a woman who was obviously strong, like her, you know, she was high, <laughs> she was high. And, and uh, I told her like, oh, you can go into the gallery and get a cup. And she's like, me, even me. And I was like, well, of course, you know, but this shock in her head that like, that an artist would talk to her or share with her, you know, really, anyway, she didn't end up going in. It was too, I don't know if the gallery ladies scared her away or what, but anyway, just, I think conversation and sharing things and, you know, in the media or whatever, they they make this fantasy about vets and their struggles and it's some kind of good and noble thing. Like that was another, it was the worst, well, worst, worst best show <laughs> in Kansas City at the Nelson Atkins Museum, Catherine Futter, Futterer. She had us out there and uh, I said, you know, it's hard to get vets out there. So maybe we can invite people who've lost family to violence in the States, right? Like a black man, 18 to 30 is statistically safer in the Marine Corps in Afghanistan at the height of the war than in any large city in the United States. So as we're talking about freedom and democracy, that's something to keep in mind. Anyway, so I thought it was going to be hard to get vets to come out. So why don't you open up to a family who lost, uh, people who lost family to vets, or vets, to violence. So we did. And so I was throwing in the lobby of the museum, had two little minions that were scanning pictures of the folks so we could put on the cups later. And I, I knew I was in trouble. I saw in line, people were sobbing and crying. And, and then when they got to me, it was really striking to me that the people who had lost family in a war were proud, right? Their family, their family member had sacrificed for the country. And, and then the people who'd lost, and some of them were vets, they got killed when they came back to the States at a liquor store, you know, or, or suicide. They were kind of ashamed or like, or they were, there was like a chip on their shoulder. Like my, my child was a good child and he didn't deserve to die this way. Like, obviously not, but I mean, obviously he didn't deserve it that way, but it was really striking how the, they kind of make a big, it's a good and noble thing to die in a war. And it's like a despicable, cheap thing to be killed. And, you know, but it seems to me like, there's, there's a connection and everybody goes through some trauma, you know, like uh, sexual, with military sexual rape, right? <laughs> They're talking about like, everybody's going through trauma. Everybody's going through something. And so just, you know, just having a place, right? Like the cups and ideally talking about fantasies, they're just cups and that's, that's my safe space. <laughs> but ideally they'd be a place for people to talk about unspeakable things, right? A touchstone where, where this allows, you know, like 
whatever, at a club, you start talking about <laughs> combat or rape or something. It's not, <laughs> people don't respond well, but, but with the cups, you can start talking about these heavy issues that aren't encouraged in polite conversation. I feel that's a long answer though. It's a good and answer though. Anybody who does, bless anybody who does performance art, man, like singing or that kind of stuff, like you have to be there in the moment and, and it's, it's magic when you're there, but you know, it doesn't get recorded the same way and my junk, 500,000 to a million years, so I'm cheating. Uh, Aaron Hughes has a question for you. Uh -oh. uh, what advice do you have for emerging veteran artists? And it's a two-parter. What does it mean to make honest work in these times? Man, I knew he was going to ask some, like, hard question. I don't know, man. I mean, again, I feel like, well, on one thing, too, there's, you know, like a veteran artist, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why is it a veteran artist? You know, why is it a black artist? Why is it a woman artist? Why isn't it just an artist? They don't call it bougie white rich boy art. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, but so there's some, and not that I'm, you know, I always have shows on Veterans Day and Memorial Day. <laughs> Guaranteed there's a show someplace for me. So, and I'll take them. You know, I'm not, there's a African American woman, she, she refused the show in February because it's Black History Month. It's like, nope, invite me in the front door, you know? So, but I think the advice is just, you know, make your work, make your work, whatever it is, you know, do it. And, you know, I think a lot of the stuff I did initially right after I got out of the Marine Corps was kind of more in your face and, you know, just junk I needed to get out. And, but as I age and, you know, have a son and, and see how things overlap, you know, the same way we, we talk about, you know, people in a foreign land now, people are talking about other Americans as there's some kind of threat to society, you know, just for being who they are. But um, yeah, make your work. And, and, you know, and I'd say too, like, kind of build a foundation. Ken Price, my teacher at USC, he was saying like, you don't want that meteor meteoric rise in the art world, right? Because you, you sell out, sell a bunch of work. And then that second or third show, people that bought work on the first show they're trying to resell it and then the value goes down so he was saying you know just i think about pyrometric cones time and temperature right you just want to work hard at a, at a level that you can you can sustain right don't max out your damn credit cards because you got this really great idea <laughs> like you just keep keep working you know make a bunch of maquettes if you can't afford the full size thing make make small scale work make work that you can afford but keep making and, and don't don't expect anybody to ever give a shit about what you're doing. Like there's a lot of stuff going on in the world and our society is really not set up to like, you know, contemplate deeply <laughs> things. It's, it's buy and sell. And so, you know, do, do the work for yourself. That's actually Ken Price again said, uh, you know, make a bunch of work. Don't think too much, just make a bunch of work. And then once you've made the work, then look at it and get rid of everything that's not yours. If you are successful, you will create your own idiom, your own language. So, you know, I, I think that's good advice, but make your work, whatever that is. And two, like, you know, if you, whatever, like if you're a vet, you don't have to make work about war, right? You don't, if you're a woman, you don't have to make work about being a mother or, you know, <laughs> just make your work, whatever that is. and. And don't let people like throw you in the hole, um, you know, tell mm -hmm. them to make their own damn work. <laughs> right. But, but I mean, Ken Price too, right? Like, so he was, you know, he was selling work. This is what, 15 years ago. He was selling work for 40 grand a piece. And I was asking him, you know, for advice. And he was quiet for a long time. He's like, yeah, I'm trying to think of something good to say. I don't know if he meant positive or like deep. But he's like, you know, it sucks when nobody knows your work and you're not selling work for obvious reason, but it sucks too when they do know your work because they want you to make that one thing over and over again, right? You're, it's a commodity that they want. And so like, yeah. so you're making this, he, he came back one summer. I was like, hey, Ken, how was your summer? It's like, oh, it was great. I made a bunch of work nobody's ever going to see. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't understand. But later it turned out he had made this work over the summer and took it to his gallery and the gallery wasn't interested didn't want to show it um so he he a friend after his gallery passed on a friend showed his work and it all sold out <laughs> so he got to he got 
he did it both. But yeah, um, yeah, you got to make your work, make your work, and set it up so you can sustain it. You know. That actually uh, leads into a, a, another question of mine: Is um, do you foresee a change in the body of the work you make? Like, do you foresee yourself with like the cup making a lifelong project? And not in geologic terms, but in human terms, not 500,000 to a million years. Yeah, well, you said the body of work. Um, the clay body that I'm using right now, okay. somebody uh, gave me 750 pounds of cone five frost, this really nice porcelain. Oh, yeah. It was too hard. So, well, that's a tip. So the clay was too hard. If you take a, like half a cup for me, the way I work, half a cup of water, and I use a Jessica Putnam Phillips, her cup is the, I think it's got magic pixie fairy dust on it or something. Put half a cup of that water in the bag, seal the bag up, and then put that sealed bag inside a five gallon bucket of water. And somehow that pushes, I just leave it overnight and it works out to be good for me. But it pushes the water back into the, the clay and then wedge it up and that's what I'm, that's what this is. So my clay body will change when I run out of that clay because it's freaking expensive <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to use it if anyway but yeah I mean hopefully I evolve I mean as a human and as an artist that like if you look at some of those cups I made 15 years ago they're pretty awful and if they drop on your foot you'll break your foot for sure but you know and that and as the you know um, meeting other vets and other people other images get added to the the lexicon of stamp stuff so but yeah, I mean, I I think I'm probably gonna make cups to the end. That's a nice thing too about, I'd say, um, the difference between craft and art. I feel like art, you gotta be hot, you know, like you gotta look good in a bikini or <laughs> whatever. But but craft is like some respect for being a geezer and like letting letting your hands actually, you know, learn take giving your hands the time to learn how to do things. So, I don't know. That, that kind of brings me to a question I had for you, because you sort of touched on this, talking about showing and the sort of pitfalls of having a good meteoric rise, like you said. So I was just going to ask uh, if things about the art world are showing in exhibitions that you liked or thought think is useful, or, and you know, just aspects of it that you haven't liked or you think could be improved upon. Well, like I said, I mean, you know, I started this thing thinking that like art was something above crass commercial bullshit, but <laughs> nothing in our society, not medicine, not, not science, not even our weapons, you know, like it's not, it's all subject to commerce and it's all subject to, you know, does it sell or, so that's just, that's not super interesting to me. I'm not ripping on anybody, you know, I have a day job, uh, knock on wood there. Um, you know, so I don't, I don't, and I live with my mother-in-law. Thank you, Marcia. So, so I don't have to, have to sell the cups to make a living. You know, the day may come mm -hmm. where I do need to sell the cups to make a living, <laughs> but it's not here yet. So, um, you know, it just, it, I'm not super interested in, in the one true art world. And like I said, you know, like, uh, I forget the woman's name, but, you know, I don't, I don't I'm not about making, I don't, I don't want art. I don't think art should be about just making pretty things for people with more money than you. You know, I don't think religion should be about whatever. Anyway. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that's the commercial art world is a commercial art world. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. No, no, I thought that was a good answer. And again, I'm not ripping on other people. I don't, it's not my intention to, or galleries or whatever. It's just, you know, it's just, it's not what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also just gonna ask um, if there is anything that you, uh, you know, I was gonna ask what you, really like about what you're able to do and just what you dislike about what you're able to do uh, like working in a creative field like what are what are things you 
love about it? What are things that you're just like, this is not what people say it is? Well, I mean, you know, making and sharing the cups is a huge joy. You know, and again, it's that community building and expanding the community. Like, it's funny now, like with Facebook and all these weird things, like, I was talking to this guy and I was sure that I knew him. I was sure that I met him and just, you know, maybe at Enseeker or something, but I got drunk and forgot or, you know, I was sure we were buddies. And like, after talking for months, he's like, yeah, man, I look forward to meeting you. I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> Cause I thought I'd just forgotten where we met, but <clears throat> you know, but that community and, and being able to share and make the work, that's just a super joy, you know, like, um, whatever the posturing and like the egos and garbage like that like i'm less interested in like you know uh, but i think that's anywhere it's not just art or craft or you know i mean god it'd be even more frustrating if i was a doctor and instead of the best like the doctor that played golf with the boss guy got the promotion and the really good doctor who looks kind of funny <laughs> you know got passed over that would just be crushing like if i don't get a show so like you know big deal but but it affects every, you know, we're just dumb monkeys with clothes. <laughs> so it's everywhere. So, I mean, the things I like and dislike about the art world are the same things I like and dislike about every other aspect of our culture. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because um, would you identify yourself as an artist or a maker or a cup maker? And do you think these labels are even important at all for artists? Or Again, Ken Price said, said uh, you need the division of labor in the arts, right? <laughs> like, so he was talking specifically about galleries that you need somebody else to sell your work. You know, he said it'd kill you if you tried to sell your own work, tried to like tell some stockbroker why the work is worth 40 grand, you know, like, but, but I think through, you know, with art history and all that, like, I think we all as makers or just as humans, we all have fantasies about what we're doing, mm -hmm. but like the gap between what we think we're doing, what we do is kind of vast and painful. So like I say, you know, I mean, all those radicals from the sixties, you know, now their stocks kicked in and they're just as conservative as the, anyway. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to like maintain, you know, like uh, not get too, sorry, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Are labels important as an, uh, as an artist or a maker? Not to me. Not, yeah. No, I don't, I don't, I mean, you know, and I, you know, whatever you see people try to like rip me down, oh, fucking Potter, like whatever, you know, like what are, you know, I don't know. It doesn't matter. But, and again, like, you know, some art historian can figure it out. They can put me in what, what part, what, what part of the library I go to, if I even make it into the library, <laughs> you know, like, so I don't, it's not my problem. Yeah, I think what's, you know, you were mentioning earlier, like, why do you have to be a veteran artist? Why does it have to be this or that? Like, I feel like sometimes those labels can be limiting to the creative process, maybe. Well, maybe, but also, I mean, also to who can see it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's been shows where it's like, it's a African American show or it's a women's show, like, you know, and as a viewer, am I welcome in the space? Like, if I show up there, like, because I'm not a woman and I'm not black, can I go to the gallery that's with you know so same with vets like if i'm a veteran artist then is it just tattooed like drunks that show up or <laughs> like you know like can anybody come you yeah. know and like are they going to feel welcome or is it going to put them off and so will it be relatable or yeah yeah so it's yeah. just you know i think all that stuff is it's not helpful for anybody really you know like but but you know uh, blah 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 And I, I wanted to ask you, you had talked about uh, your work from 15 years ago. You said it was really bad and it would break your foot. So that is one question I had for you. Uh, that was just how your stuff's changed over time. Has it just changed in like, you technically uh, improving and exploring your craft or uh, what you've been experimenting with or putting on the surface? Well, I mean, it's also just my ignorance, right? Like, you know, like when you first center something, you've, oh, look what I did. Yeah. <laughs> like, without having like seen Chinese or Korean pottery from thousand years ago, like, oh, 
yeah, that's much better. <laughs> like, so you start off young and dumb and think you're like, your work's so good and so strong, but then, you know, then you, you see the bigger context that you're in and realize, ooh, I better get back to the studio. <laughs> so I think that's a, that's one thing, but yeah, I mean, just, you know, it's a really physical thing and it takes, it takes a while to get the feel. It's actually one of the things my, uh, Phil Cornelius was prior army between Vietnam and Korea and I was Marine Corps. And so there was a little rivalry there. Like, you know, I'm trying to throw and, uh, it's wiggle woggle and look at big Sergeant tool getting his ass kicked by five pounds of clay. <laughs> it's like, Oh, it's on old man. So trying to like, I don't know. I forgot the question. <laughs> oh, I, I was just asking. I'm how sorry, you internet. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're good. I, I feel like I keep asking you like three part questions, so it's not your fault. I was I was just wondering how you felt like your work had really just changed over time. If it was just a technical thing or how you're approaching it. Well, I mean, sure. There's the technical. Yeah. So physically, like muscle memory. That's what I was saying. He was talking about Cornelius was talking about muscle memory, bone support, and 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 I was like, that's. That sounds like my primary marksmanship instructor talking about bone support and muscle memory. So that, but then, but then also like, you know, I, I wasn't, when I started, I didn't have a kid and now I have a kid and it's like, you know, dear world, I have a son, please unfuck yourself. <laughs> you know, like that was a, like when I joined the Marine Corps, I was like, I, I took my chances. I made it. Others didn't. So be it. After my son was born, you know, now everybody's somebody's kid, you know, mm -hmm. like, not to get too political, but my overwhelming feeling for Trump is pity. That boy was not loved as a child. <laughs> like there's something he's too, he needs it too much. He needs the, the outside support too much. Like there's, he, he really, I, I feel like I, he needs a hug. <laughs> we can't do that anyway. So yeah, so, you know, just I am changing as a human. And so hopefully my work's changing, right? Like the, the war is, you know, the wars are still going on. So I'm still making work about those wars. I'm still making work for, for young guys that are coming back or, you know, for their families if they pass. Like, um, you know, and just like, whatever, the same way we talk about like Agent Orange or, you know, we, the war in Vietnam is not going well. We need to bomb more. And like, okay, the pests are dying on the crops now. So we need to put more pesticides instead of rethinking agriculture and how we do things, we just put more chemicals in the environment, like bomb more, it's not. So then things in my head, you know, there's a lot of connections in the work in my head that I don't know anybody else necessarily catches, but, but you know, there's overlaps. And as I learn more and, or it's, it's not from reading, it's not from research, it's meeting more people and having more people tell me their experiences, you know, that's how I learn best. and. And so the you know, work is changing and evolving, hopefully. Whether anybody else sees it or not, it's not, I don't know, but in my head, it's changing. Well, I think we're at our 45 minute mark, Aaron. Um, thank you so much for taking the time and, you know, what Speaking with us and, you know, stamps. sharing all this with us. I was going to do the stamps now. Dude. You're going to do stamps? Yeah. I mean, I just got to get this one off the wheel. And... You get one stamp. Okay, one stamp. <laughs> so, my huge studio here. Pay attention, internet. Yeah. Internet potters. It's all right, internet. You don't have to pay attention. You can't make him do stuff. All right. So stamps. I mean, right? They can leave if they want to, right? There's nobody. I can't tell when people log off or. Nope. That's something to you. you got to change the letter box there, Sergeant Ty Ty. Oh, uh, no. No reason whatsoever. But Aaron Hughes has a. A good one, a good counter to you, if you're willing. What? About identity. What? About artist identity. 
He's a fucking genius, man. You should be talking to him. And no, no, I don't. Want, I don't want to have to deal with this question. It's way too smart for me. Um, Aaron says it seems that claiming identity is often a way for a group to claim their voice instead of sorry, Aaron, Aaron's uh, to claim their voice instead of allowing others to speak for them. For veterans, others are often speaking for them. Politicians, media media curators, etc. With your critic of identity in mind, what advantages, if any, do you think there is in claiming your uh, veteran, sorry, your veteran identity as in being in dialogue with other veterans from the veteran art, art movement? Oof. Wow. See, man? He's <laughs> that boy is smart. Uh, that's a good yeah, question. I, I can I can see that also, you know, as another yeah, for sure. I mean I mean I'm sure it's the same with like movies and TV shows that are about, you know, a different community and none of the writers are from that community. You know, there's there's obviously a problem with that, but um yeah, I see that. But I mean I think it's it's really the I feel like a lot of it has to do with the curator. You know, if the curator makes leaves room for the artist to be more than just a vet or leaves room for there to be connections with other people. Mm -hmm. But if it's just, you know, it's we're doing this show on Veterans Day and or we're doing like I was in this uh, documentary and uh, and they it was I was just the wounded vet. You know, I was like the broken vet who found salvation in craft. And it was just the most like and a lot of people reacted to it and like, oh, we love your work. And that's great. Lola. But it was just, it was really kind of a cliche response to my experience. And so whatever, they're making their movie, they're doing their thing, you know, but I was, I didn't feel like they were listening to what I was saying or responding. Um, you know, it was just a cliche. So of course, like finding community is important, but, I, but I'd say like the deal too is to expand the community, not just like, I mean, that's one of the things I loved in the Marine Corps you know, you come from the South, you come from the North, you educated, not educated, loved, not loved, they shave your head, they put you in a funny uniform and put you in this messed up situation. And then all this stuff that like would have meant something in a club or would have meant something in garrison. But when you're in the field, like things, there's a different priority thing and you get to have interactions with people on a, on a different, in a different way. And so I'd like, you know, I'd like that to be in shows and and things that there's room, like Aaron Hughes did a great thing that a uh, uh, triennial in Chicago, um, <clears throat> you know, he had kids from Chicago who'd, who'd been victims of gun violence. And I thought that was a really important, you know, connection to make with uh, veterans, you know, and just kids who grew up in the wrong part of town and had to live through, you know, gunshot wounds and, you know, survive gunshot wounds, and so making that connection, expanding the, expanding the connections instead of limiting them or restricting them. <laughs> so. All right, so that's how I do the stamps. Thanks, Aaron Hughes, freaking genius. I love you. <clears throat> See stamps. All right. Okay. Do you have a a follow up question to that? Um, I just wanted to just end by telling you, thanks so much for doing this. This is, it's really interesting hearing you talk about your work and, and it's just interesting hearing you talk, you, you express yourself in a really interesting and funny way, which I like, and I'm not alone. Uh, someone who is watching, um, Amanda Summerlin says, Aaron Toole is officially the artist I'd most love to have a beer with. Whatever that means. Thanks for being real and honest in a world where it's not common. So, oh, right on. You must be pretty neat. Well, that's cool. Or she just likes beer. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So that's so great. So Amanda's just neat. Yeah. When you're in Berkeley, come check me out. Oh uh, yeah. All right. So that's if that's whatever. You guys can go if you want to go now. I'll be here making cuffs <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> Well, Aaron, thanks so much, man. I really do appreciate it. We all appreciate it. And uh, the Hudgens viewing audience is now wiser. Right on. Well, <laughs> I hope so.
Oh, wow, you can really see my belly jiggle there. That's nice. All right. Thanks, folks. Love you all. Thanks, man. See you soon. Strength. Bye.